50,000 butterflies released into a scorched hellscape. Sounds like ecological disaster waiting to happen, right? Actually, what scientists observed in the months that followed changed everything we thought we knew about forest recovery. Keep watching, because this gets wild. September 2020. The Creek Fire is tearing through California's Sierra Nevada at a speed that makes firefighters physically ill. We're talking 379,000 acres consumed. That's bigger than the entire city of Los Angeles turned to ash. The flames moved so fast that rescue helicopters had to airlift over 200 trapped campers from Mammoth Pool Reservoir in complete darkness, surrounded by walls of fire on all sides. One of the most dramatic rescues in California history. But here's where it gets interesting. When the flames finally died and researchers entered what remained of the forest, they found something nobody expected. Sure, the trees were gone. The undergrowth? Obliterated. But the soil itself was doing something weird. Some for over a century were waking up. These weren't your typical forest floor plants. These were pioneer species. The botanical equivalent of those people who show up at 4 a.m. to camp outside a store on Black Friday. First in line, ready to claim territory before anyone else gets there. And they needed help. Desperately. Now before you picture some grad student releasing a swarm of monarchs into the wasteland like some Disney movie, let's back up. Because what actually happened is so much stranger and more fascinating than that. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife had a problem. Actually, they had about 50,000 problems, and every single one of them had wings. You see, California doesn't just have butterflies. It has an absolutely ridiculous number of butterfly species. Over 250 to be exact, and a huge chunk of them exist nowhere else on Earth. They evolved here, adapted to these specific mountains and valleys and microclimates. And if they disappear from California, they disappear from existence. The creek fire burned right through critical habitat for at least 70 of these species. 70. That's like burning down 70 different apartment buildings and expecting everyone to just figure out new housing on their own. But butterflies aren't just pretty things that look nice on nature documentaries. They're pollinators, and not the lazy kind either. While bees tend to be generalists, visiting whatever flowers are convenient, many butterfly species are specialists. Obsessive incredibly picky specialists. Some California butterflies will only pollinate one or two specific plant species. Nothing else. It's the ultimate committed relationship. So when those pioneer plants started sprouting in the burn zone, pushing up through the ash like green middle fingers to the concept of destruction, they had a problem. No pollinators. The local butterfly populations had either burned or evacuated to wherever butterflies evacuate to when their home turns into a literal inferno. This is where Dr. Sarah Chen enters our story. That's her real name. And no, she doesn't appreciate the irony of a conservation biologist having the most common surname in existence. Dr. Chen had been running a butterfly breeding program in the Central Valley for three years when the Creek Fire hit. The program wasn't originally designed for disaster response. It was designed to bulk up populations of endangered species, slowly and carefully reintroduce them to protected areas and generally tried to unfuck decades of habitat loss. But when she saw the satellite images of the burn zone and realized what was happening with those pioneer species, she had an idea that her department chair later described as either brilliant or completely unhinged. She was going to release 50,000 butterflies into a burned wasteland and see what happened. Now you might be thinking this sounds simple. Breed butterflies, put them in boxes, drive to burn zone, open boxes, the gun, Congratulations, you've restored an ecosystem. Yeah. No, not even close. First problem, which species? Remember, California has over 250 butterfly species, and the breeding program only maintained populations of about 30. And those 30 weren't chosen at random. They were the endangered ones. The species hanging on by a thread, the butterflies that probably shouldn't be used as guinea pigs in an experimental rewilding project. But Dr. Chen had a theory. She'd been studying pollinator networks for 15 years, and she knew something most people don't. In any given ecosystem, there are keystone pollinators, species that if you remove them, the whole thing collapses like a Jenga tower made of wishful thinking. She identified 12 species that based on historical data and her own fieldwork, would have been the primary pollinators in the pre-fire ecosystem. 
12 species that if successfully re-established could theoretically kickstart the entire recovery process. So she went to her bosses with a proposal. Take the breeding program, ramp it up to absolute maximum capacity, and produce 50,000 individuals across these 12 keystone species. Then release them all at once into the burn zone during the optimal flight season. The response was about what you'd expect. A lot of concerned looks. But here's the thing about California in 2020. The state was burning, not figuratively, literally burning, over 4 million acres that year alone. The old playbook of careful, slow, methodical ecosystem restoration wasn't working because ecosystems were being destroyed faster than they could be restored. So in a decision that probably required several people to sign a lot of liability waivers, the project got approved. The breeding operation kicked into high gear in March 2021. If you've never seen an industrial-scale butterfly breeding facility, it's simultaneously beautiful and deeply weird. Imagine a warehouse full of mesh enclosures, each containing hundreds or thousands of caterpillars, all munching on carefully cultivated host plants, all on precisely timed development schedules. Because that's the thing about butterflies. You can't just release caterpillars and hope for the best. They're incredibly vulnerable, and the survival rate would be abysmal. You need to release adults during their flight season, when temperatures are right, when host plants are present, when the whole complicated puzzle of butterfly life actually has a chance of fitting together. The team had a four-week window in late June and early July 2021. That's it. Four weeks to release 50,000 butterflies or the whole project was dead in the water for another year. And there were complications. What oh, were there complications? A massive heat wave hit California. We're talking temperatures in the Central Valley hitting 118 degrees Fahrenheit. The kind of heat where the asphalt melts and your car's steering wheel can give you second-degree burns. Butterflies are cold-blooded. Their body temperature is whatever the ambient temperature is. And while they can handle heat better than you'd think, there are limits. Above a certain temperature, they literally can't fly. Their wing muscles don't work properly. So the entire operation almost died right there. 50,000 butterflies ready to go, and it was too hot to transport them. Dr. Chen's solution. Transport them at night. Load the butterflies into climate-controlled trucks at 10 p.m. Drive through the darkness and arrive at the burn zone right at dawn when temperatures were still manageable. The convoy left Sacramento at 11.47 p.m. on June 24, 2021. Three trucks, four researchers, two graduate students who definitely weren't getting paid enough for this, and 50,000 butterflies. They arrived at the Creek Fire burn zone as the sun was coming up, painting the scorched landscape in shades of orange and gold that were probably beautiful if you didn't know you were looking at an ecological disaster area. And here's where the story gets really interesting. The plan was to release the butterflies gradually over three days, monitoring their behavior, making sure they didn't immediately die or fly away or do any of the thousand things that could go wrong. They released the first batch, 5,000 individuals from three species, carefully opened the mesh containers and let them go and the butterflies just sat there. For almost 20 minutes, these butterflies bred in captivity born in a warehouse, who'd never seen wild California habitat in their lives, just sat on the mesh containers with their wings folded, not moving. One of the grad students later admitted they thought the whole project had failed in the first 20 minutes, that the butterflies were somehow defective, or too inbred, or just fundamentally broken. Then the sun hit them, direct sunlight warming their wings, and they woke up, 50,000 butterflies don't leave all at once. It's not a swarm. It's more like a slow motion explosion of color. Orange and black, blue and white, yellow and brown, spreading out across the burn zone like living confetti. And then they did something nobody predicted. They started feeding immediately. Not all of them, but a significant percentage made a direct line for the pioneer plants that had sprouted in the ash. Lupinins, mostly. And fireweed and this obscure little flower called Whispering Bells that only grows in recently burned areas. Dr. Chen said later that watching it felt like watching a complicated machine click into place. Each species knew, somehow, instinctively, what it was supposed to be doing. The checker spot butterflies went straight for the paintbrush flowers. The blues clustered on the lupines, the swallowtails, the big showy ones with the dramatic wing shapes, 
found patches of buckwheat that had sprouted near a creek bed. Within six hours of release, researchers observed pollination behavior from all 12 target species. Within three days, they found fresh eggs on host plants. Within two weeks, they confirmed caterpillar populations establishing in the wild. But here's what nobody saw coming. The secondary effects. Butterflies don't just pollinate, they're food. Butterfly caterpillars are absolute protein bombs for birds, and butterfly adults are key prey for everything from dragonflies to bats to certain species of wasps. And all of those predators had been hanging around the burn zone, looking depressed and confused because their entire food web had just gone up in smoke. Six weeks after the butterfly release, bird populations in the burn zone increased by 340%. 340%. Researchers spotted species that hadn't been seen in the area for years, drawn back by the sudden abundance of butterfly caterpillars. Small mammal populations started ticking up. Mice and voles and shrews, attracted by the seeds from the plants that the butterflies had pollinated. Twelve weeks after release, researchers confirmed the presence of coyotes, foxes, and at least one bobcat in the burn zone, predators following the prey. The food web was rebuilding itself from the bottom up, faster than anyone thought possible. And it all started with 50,000 butterflies. Now, was it all sunshine and successful ecosystem restoration? Of course not. This is real science, not a feel-good documentary. About 30% of the released butterflies died within the first week. Some from predation, some from the harsh conditions, some probably just from the stress of being released into a burn zone. Another 20% apparently said screw this and migrated out of the area entirely, which is actually impressive for an insect with a wingspan of 2 inches. But that remaining 50%? They established breeding populations, all reproducing in the wild, all contributing to the pollination network that was slowly knitting the burn zone back together. By September 2021, three months post-release, the burn zone was showing vegetation recovery rates 60% faster than comparable burned areas without butterfly intervention. By spring 2022, wildflower blooms in the release area were described by one researcher as frankly absurd. We're talking carpets of color visible from satellite imagery. All because those pioneer plants had been successfully pollinated the previous summer. And by fall 2022, the area was showing early signs of tree seedling establishment, pine and fir seedlings poking up through the undergrowth, the first hints that this burned valley might actually become a forest again. All of this, and I cannot stress this enough, because someone released 50,000 butterflies. Dr. Chen published her findings in March 2023. The paper was titled Rapid Pollinator Reintroduction as a Tool for Post-Fire Ecosystem Recovery. It's incredibly dry reading, full of statistical analyses and ecological modeling, and it fundamentally changed how land managers think about fire recovery. Because here's the thing, we've always approached ecosystem restoration backwards. We try to restore the habitat first, then slowly reintroduce species, then hope everything clicks together eventually. But Dr. Chen proved you can flip that. Bring back the pollinators first, and they'll help rebuild the habitat. It's faster, more efficient, and apparently it works. The Creek Fire Butterfly release has now been used as a model for seven other post-fire restoration projects across California, Oregon, and Montana. Tens of thousands more butterflies released into burn zones, all helping to speed up recovery. And it all happened because one scientist looked at a burned valley and thought, what if we just dumped a whole lot of butterflies in there and saw what happened? Sometimes the best science is just controlled chaos with really good documentation. Thanks for watching. If this story made you look at butterflies differently, hit that subscribe button because nature gets weird in the best possible ways. And we've got a lot more of these stories coming. See you next time.